Good morning, everyone, and welcome to OCOW's webinar titled The Impact of COVID-19 on Workplace Ergonomics, presented by Melissa Statham and Duane Fuchs, ergonomists with OCOW. My name is Jennifer, and I will be moderating today's session. This webinar is being recorded. Um, so we ask you to please remain on mute throughout the presentation out of respect for the presenters and future viewers. We will dedicate 15 minutes at the end of the session for questions. All questions should be typed in the chat box. For further questions, please email ergo at ohcow.on.ca. I will insert that uh, email in the chat box. Please be sure to complete the feedback form that I will also link after the session. Uh, and let me introduce you to our first presenter, Dwayne Fuchs, to begin the session. Hello, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, hopefully everybody's having a, a good day out there, early September, and everybody's uh, <clears throat> slowly starting trying to get back to, um, to hopefully some semblance of normalcy in the situation that we're currently in. Uh, so that's what we're gonna speak about today. We're gonna speak about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, workplace uh, ergonomics. So um, this is just a little overview of what we're gonna do. We're going to obviously speak to ergonomics, um, talk about some musculoskeletal disorders. And then uh, Melissa is going to um, branch into the ergonomic hazards and COVID-19 and how that's that's affected us and some things that we can maybe look forward to uh, to trying to deal with so that we can uh, hopefully help ourselves out along the line as we try to return back to uh, to some semblance of working normalcy. So obviously, um, as everybody knows, um, the pandemic has changed a lot of things. Um, I mean, it's pretty much changed everything in, in how we operate, uh, but it's, it's definitely changed how, how our work is being performed. Um, it's uh, changed the layout of our workplaces. And if it hasn't changed the layout of our workplaces now, it definitely will in the very near future when people do get back to, to working uh, and or working from their regular normal traditional workspaces. Um, it's changed where the work has been done. It's obviously changed our workforce um, in terms of uh, production magnitude, things that are are being produced and, and utilized as as we go through. Uh, so the question is uh, that we're presenting here today is how does that affect our workplace ergonomics? How has the pandemic changed those types of things? So to begin with, we'll go through. I'm going to go through some uh, some information on on ergonomics in general and and risk factors. And ergonomics is, or ergonomic intervention, is important because we want to be working smarter, not harder. It's in general, it's matching the job, the equipment, and the workstation to the workers. It's it's a field of study that we try to to have individuals <clears throat> work their their machines, their jobs, everything that they utilize. We try to have that, those things designed to be more specific to those individuals in hopes of decreasing potential injuries and or other physical disorders. So why do we even deal with ergonomics? Why are we looking at ergonomic intervention at all? Well, number one, it <clears throat> correct ergonomic intervention if it's followed by employees and and de dealt with correctly, um, it increases the worker's health, it, which in turn increases workplace morale as well as employee relations. In turn, by doing so, it decreases the potential of musculoskeletal injuries. Um, it 
also then decreases WSIB costs. And by doing these things, it increases the quality and the production of whatever it is you happen to be working on, and therefore decreases the money spent on on the costs that that an individual business um, needs to spend on some of these other issues, lost time, WSIB costs, um, dealing with uh, employees that are having having morale issues and, and difficulties and, and things such as that. There's two main approaches that you can take when we're dealing with ergonomic intervention. Uh, one is the reactive approach, which is basically looking at the ergonomics and looking at your workstation and your work design after some sort of physical disorder or musculoskeletal disorder has already happened. Um, for instance, an individual goes off work uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, we could also look at um, the ergonomics of their workstation when they come back to work uh, to try to help prevent that. That's an example of reactive ergonomics. A, a better approach is a proactive approach, which means that we look at the ergonomics of the the workplace and the ergonomics of the individual prior to, to anything, any problems arising. This approach is preferred, obviously, because it helps prevent the injuries from happening to begin with. Uh, it also obviously helps decrease the WSIB costs. Um, <clears throat> correct ergonomic intervention and setup prior to issues is obviously the, the best the best approach and hopefully while we get through you know through the nuts and bolts of the presentation and, and the information you get later on in the presentation from melissa hopefully you'll be able to implement some of the information that we provide to you to go back to your <clears throat> your workplace um, whether you're back there now or in preparation to return back to your to your regular workplace uh, so that you are looking at proper ergonomic interventions to try to prevent uh, further or to prevent issues from happening in the first place. So when we're looking at ergonomic intervention, <clears throat> what we're attempting <laughs> to, to do is we're attempting to decrease and or eliminate the onset of musculoskeletal disorders. Um, which are in general, I mean, there's there's a lot of different definitions, but in, in general, they tend to be overuse type injuries. Um, and there's several work uh, risk factors involved in potentially acquiring musculoskeletal disorders. Repetition, obviously performing any type of movement or any type of task, uh, on a continual basis, force, <clears throat> having to exert force or having forces exerted upon you, static postures, holding something for a long period of time, contact stress, uh, which is basically placing external stress upon the body uh, physically. I'm going to go through some, I'm going to go through all of these risk factors in a little more detail as we, as we progress. Awkward postures, anything that is a deviation from uh, what we would term as a neutral posture. Extreme temperatures, either really hot temperatures or really cold temperatures. Vibration, um, <clears throat> things that, that cause the body to, to basically move, <laughs> to, to move on its own. Uh, psychosocial factors, which is basically workplace stress. So all of these eight risk factors play a role in the potential acquisition of musculoskeletal disorders. So force, <clears throat> there's basically two types of force. External force, which is- Trevor, can you hear me? Which is um, external forces, which are applied to the body from outside sources. Um, a good example is having to lift something up. Um, internal forces, 
forces that are applied to <clears throat> to your body within your 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 own musculature. So for instance, that's a really great picture there of the force required from the neck and shoulders to support the arms while doing what most of us do on a regular, if not constant basis, obviously looking at uh, some sort of uh, a device or a, a, a smartphone or something of that nature. Forces can be imparted upon the body by having to move something, uh, lifting something, carrying anything that requires you to exert muscular effort. Even small things such as the photo on the right hand side uh, where the individual is is utilizing a <clears throat> an icing applicator uh, even within the office office environment a lot of people don't don't take a look at the forces but forces required to squeeze a stapler um, forces required to put paper in a photocopier or a, a printer something like that. Repetition is basically performing the same type of movement many times over a given period of time. So obviously the greater number of repetitions performed leads to an increase of physical exertion required, which potentially leads to an increase in, in tissue damage and a potential increase in in uh, repetitive strain injuries. So the greater number of repetitions performed requires a greater amount of, of recovery time. So this basically shows that. I mean, it, it shows that as, as you move to the right of the graph, you've performed a number of repetitions. If you've performed a number of repetitions under a low, uh, a low magnitude of load without having to exert a lot of force, you can do more repetitions. Um, but as you do more repetition with a greater force, it decreases the, the amount of, of tissue tolerance. So basically that's the body's ability to d adapt decreases due to the stress placed upon it. So therefore you need to rest. A great example of this is, you know, somebody doing an exercise type program. Um, you, you do a, a X number of push-ups. If an individual can do 10 or 20 or 30 push-ups, there becomes a point where you can no longer perform those. And then you, you must stop and rest. And if you rest for one, two, three, four, five minutes, you then can perform more repetitions. We often overlook what we're doing in a daily basis and, and we don't equate it to something of that fashion where we really need to, to remember that, that the movements that we're doing on a regular basis are very similar to what we would be doing in an exercise program. So the greater amount of, of force you're putting upon the body via repetition, the more rest that's required so that you can have recuperation within within the body. Posture. Um, awkward postures tend to lead to fatigue. They also, they lead to strength uh, limitations uh, due to, to minimal movement. Um, neutral posture is a posture which positions the body with the least amount of stress. So anything that deviates from what I would term as a neutral posture would be considered awkward. So the photo on the bottom right basically shows you an example of, of what I would term as neutral standing posture with everything in pretty much in alignment. Okay, so that tends to place the least amount of stress on the body. So anything that deviates from that position such as bending sideways, forward, rotation, <clears throat> any types of deviations from that are what would be considered awkward postures. Those types of things tend to put more strain and more stress on the muscles, the ligaments, and the tendons of the body.
And then obviously when we get back to the whole repetition thing, without breaks and rest intervals in between there, they do not allow those structures of the body to recuperate properly. Static postures are when any posture, any posture is held for a long period of time. Even if you're in quote unquote neutral posture, if it's held for a long period of time, it can still, or it still will decrease blood flow. Um, it can lead to early onset of fatigue. If you look at the little, the little graphs on the right hand side, where it shows, you know, the, the blood flow required and the blood flow provided, it shows you that static postures do not, do not allow ample blood flow. So the, the musculature is not getting that, that flow of blood and nutrients to it in order to help keep it in that position. Okay, now on, on the left-hand side, those six photos show people in awkward static postures. So that's even, even a worse situation. Going back, uh, one slide there, I, I, I failed to mention that from a seated position, I would term neutral posture as basically your, your upper posture, your upper body posture similar with your shoulders and your neck in alignment, <clears throat> but your lower body, your, your ankles, your knees, your, and your hips to be somewhere hovering around the 90 degree area. Okay. But again, anybody that's sat in quote unquote neutral posture for long extended periods of time, they would realize that, that that potentially puts stresses upon your body as well. Contact stress. Contact stress is, is basically <clears throat> an external force being placed upon your body. So, I mean, if you take your finger and you push it deep into your thigh and, and push on it, that's a, an example of contact stress. While you're sitting on a chair, on a couch, on, on anything, the, the stress placed upon the underside of your legs from your body weight sitting on, on that chair or that bench is an example of contact stress. Okay, <clears throat> what happens with contact stress is it potentially occludes the blood supply and the nerve supply. And you get a very similar situation as you have in static postures, right? Where it's being, it's being occluded. You don't have the nutrients being able to, to be brought through to those, those muscular areas and the tendons and nerves, which then basically gives you, gives you some, <clears throat> it decreases the amount of rest and repetition that you potentially, uh, have there. The picture on the right hand side is a great example of contact stress. There's three different, it's four different incidents there. The one where the individual is, is holding a very small pair of pliers. So you, you have those, those pliers basically pushing into your fingers and your thumb. The right elbow and forearm is resting on, on the neck of the guitar. The left forearm is resting on the edge of the desk or the work surface. And the, the, the neck of the guitar is resting on the fingers. So for very short periods of time, and when you have that recuperation in between, it's not that large of an issue. For longer periods of time, you notice an issue where you, would, you potentially uh, might have some numbness, some pain, those types of things. Vibration is basically when there's external forces placed upon the body that lead to movement within the entire body or specific body parts. Okay. Basic people basically experience vibration from things like riding in tractors, vehicles, <clears throat> anything like that. If you've ever noticed where, you know, if you've had a rock stuck in the, in the tire of your vehicle, 
although you might have a nice uh, smooth riding vehicle, you'll notice it. it. It will go thump, 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 thump. That's a good example of extra external vibration being imparted upon the body. This, this vibration and this external small magnitude movement within the body can lead to, excuse me, can lead to obviously musculoskeletal injuries, but it can also lead to issues within the, the lower back, the upper back, disc herniation and degeneration, those types of things. Um, we also have hand arm vibration, which is more localized and it tends to affect obviously your hands and arms more. And these types of things happen what happened there? Uh, these types of things tend to happen more often when you're utilizing power tools or, again, even holding a steering wheel of a vehicle that is doesn't drive very well or that you're on a, a, a driving surface that is, is not smooth. Okay. Okay, extreme temperatures. Obviously, I mean, most people have, have, have noticed, you know, working in cold, if it's really cold, uh, the muscles and tendons become less flexible. You have decreased circulation in the arms and hands, legs and feet. A great example of temperature issues, again, is in the exercise situation. Um, people go and to perform an exercise routine of, of whatever it is. And you know, it's been instilled upon us that when you do that, you, you want to warm up the tissues, right? You want to do some sort of a, a low level cardiovascular exercise to, to increase the blood supply uh, throughout the body so that those muscles function better. Very similar to work. If you're working in cold temperatures, those muscles will not function at the same level that they normally would if they were a little bit warmer. So those extreme temperatures of cold make it make it difficult on the body. Okay. In addition, when you're working in in cold environments, you oftentimes need to wear different types of clothing, uh, gloves, boots, jackets, those types of things which then potentially changes the postures that your body will, will go into. So you end up reaching a little bit more, having to do those types of things. Similarly, if the environment is really hot or humid, that potentially places strain on the body as well um, in terms of ergonomics, because we, we tend to, if we're really hot, we tend to deviate from correct postures um, our bodies don't function as well because we, we're potentially dehydrated. Uh, the body also doesn't react as well to tools because we potentially have increased perspiration and things like that. So psychosocial risk factors are basically work-related stressors that can potentially affect workers. They can be anywhere from, you know, increased job demands, uh, low control of your job, lack of, of fairness or lack of work quality. Those types of things lead to increased stress. And stress basically creates negative body responses, which will then present if they're present for long periods of time, they can then lead to musculoskeletal disorders and physiological changes in, in tissues. So an example is if people have high work demands, you know, there's a direct impact on the forces that they will imply um, because they're stressed. I mean, if, if people, if you've ever seen somebody in, a, in an office setting, for instance, that's simply typing away at a, at a keyboard. When they're upset or stressed, instead of typing in a smooth fashion, they might be banging violently on the keyboard. 
that doesn't seem like it, it's, it's going to relate a lot in terms of musculoskeletal issues, but over time it definitely will. It increases the muscle activity and the tension. Um, it increases sensitivity to pain, um, those types of things. So psychosocial issues uh, definitely are ergonomic issues that need to be looked at. But when we're looking at, obviously in our new, new time of COVID, um, the psychosocial factors during the pandemic that are different and additional to our regular psychosocial issues we might have via work is that people might fear for their health, uh, fear for the health of, of their, their coworkers, their family members. Um, having a lack of PPE, personal protective equipment, or the requirement of personal protective equipment may increase that as well. So, I mean, for instance, even even the issue where, you know, you'll go to a, a bank, for instance, and, you know, now they have to have a shield and, and or a mask. Well, just those things in and of themselves may increase the stress of the individuals working there. Obviously, the isolation that, that a lot of people have had to deal with throughout this last six months of the pandemic also potentially increases our stress levels, okay? Not being able to maintain an exercise program, uh, going to a fitness facility, performing those, those recreational sports that we've, we've all, all done throughout our, our normal time, not being able to have those things that are, are de-stressors will potentially increase our stress levels and the psychosocial factors that are associated with work in COVID. So the common stress, the common response to that is obviously decreased mood, anxiety and depression, low motivation, all the stress. And again, those things can lead forward into increased musculoskeletal uh, disorders. So when we're looking at those, those hazards uh, and the risk factors, it is very important to know that we have all those risk factors involved. This triangle basically explains repetition, force, and posture, because we term those as, as the big three, the main risk factors, because for the most part, those are present in some form or other in everything we do, okay? <clears throat> so vibration may not be, it, it, uh, extreme temperatures may not be present, but these three main risk factors are generally present in some way, okay? <clears throat> so if you look at this example here, it's showing that if you have one of those risk factors present, you have a little bit of risk for injury. If you have two or more, your, your risk for injury goes up. Now, if you're looking at all eight risk factors where you, you have contact, stress, vibration, uh, temperature, psychosocial issues, now you can see how exponentially the risk can potentially go up. So what again, what we're looking at with ergonomic intervention in general is we're looking at attempting to decrease as much as we can those risk factors for injury, whether it be just decrease one risk factor or whether it be decrease parts of all eight risk factors, that's what we're looking at attempting to do. Because again, and I didn't explain this at the beginning, but again, what we're looking at attempting to decrease and or eliminate is musculoskeletal disorders, which are disorders that come about for the most part due to overuse. I mean, the bottom line there I have, it's an umbrella term for repetitive strain injuries, uh, musculoskeletal injuries, uh, work-related muscular disorders, 
sprains, strains, those types of things. Generally, what it means is injuries to the body due to overuse. Okay, so that's what we're attempting to decrease. The more we decrease the risk factors that I explained, the greater the chance that we're going to be able to decrease and or eliminate the onset of musculoskeletal disorders. Most people equate these, these musculoskeletal disorders with things like heavy lifting, heavy pushing, reaching, holding positions for long periods of time. But don't forget the other risk factors that are involved because they all play a role. So what we're looking at here in this little chart, again, is <coughs> we're the three stages of, of musculoskeletal disorders. The first stage, stage is basically just the onset. The third stage, you're already into major issues. Okay, so if we're, we're looking at what I mentioned earlier about reactive versus proactive ergonomic intervention, what we want to do is by being proactive, we want to try to stay within that, that first stage or even previous to that first stage. Once we're getting into the third stage, we're definitely, we're definitely looking at reactive ergonomics, which is not, not the best case scenario. I mean, it, it's, it's better to, to have ergonomic intervention late than never, but we still want to look at potentially trying to avoid it as, as much as we can. I'm going to uh, defer it to uh, Melissa now to continue on with uh, more specifics of, of COVID-19 and workplace ergonomics. I thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Dwayne explained to us uh, musculoskeletal disorders and the hazards that can lead to them. What I'm going to explain is what we can do, how we can control for these hazards. And then I'm going to look at how some of these controls we might have used in the past might not necessarily fit the landscape that we're currently in given the pandemic. So when we look at controls, there's the hierarchy of controls, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. For the purpose of this presentation, we've left out elimination and substitution, which are above engineering controls. But what we're going to look at is engineering controls, which are modifications of work to reduce exposure, administrative controls, which is altering the way we work, um, the standard operating procedures, maybe training, the maintenance of equipment. And then we're going to look at personal protective equipment as well. And as you can see in this triangle, the effectiveness of the controls moves up from personal protective equipment all the way to elimination. So by instilling a control of PPE, it's really the lowest level of control. When we're looking at engineering controls specifically, what we're doing is we're trying to eliminate the risk factor for a certain task. So if we're using a mechanical device to hold something because something is heavy, that would be an engineering control, where before the person would have to lift it, now we are using a lifting device. We could be looking at how people are working, if they're doing a lot of above shoulder reaching every work cycle, rearranging and reorganizing their work environment so that that task is between knuckle and, and, knuckle and chest height, so we're in that optimal reaching zone. It could be transforming your manual material handling um, activities. So, for example, if you had a task that you were carrying something for several feet, maybe replacing that with a push or pull by using a cart. So it's transforming and putting controls in place to take that load off the human body. Now, when we see this diagram here, I think a lot of people might see this now. It's uh, pretty common in our area at some fast food restaurants and that you're, they're using this extension pole to attach a point of sales terminal to. Though I do believe this was really only put in place because of uh, the pandemic, but inadvertently, it helped with the ergonomics of this worker's job. So it allows for physical distancing. But what else it's also doing is, is that the worker no longer is having to lean out the window and perform an extended reach to pass the sales terminal to the customer. 
So it's allowing for two things there, right? It's protecting the person from awkward postures as well as protecting them from the customer and allowing for that physical distance. When we're looking at administrative controls, this can be put in the workplace in a variety of ways. One way we see it sometimes is restricting the weight people can lift within the work environment. It could be material coming in that we say, you know, we don't want anything that's greater than 30 pounds. And it's a way to protect our workers from the lifting hazards. Um, it could be dependent on a lot of different things, the nature of the load or the distance carried. And it doesn't necessarily need to be 30 pounds. It's whatever is deemed safe or um, your workplace puts a policy forward about. Another thing that's very common in a lot of industries is just employee training, giving employees the knowledge of the hazards of the job, the standard operating procedures of how to do their job. Anytime work changes, equipment changes, training should occur. Another administrative control that we see used a lot is job rotation. Job rotation comes in a lot of different forms. It can be done hourly, break to break, um, daily, at lunch. And we'll talk about this later is, um, you know, a possible not as an effective control maybe given COVID-19. Do you want all that rotation occurring between workstations? Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the same goes for two-person or team lifts. That administrative control is put in place because whatever is being lifted was deemed either too heavy, too awkward, or unbalanced. So instead of you know putting some type of engineering control, we're going to throw more manpower at it in order to safely lift that uh, piece of equipment or our our particle. So, and that's an example as far as in the COVID nineteen world, um, for lack of a better term is right now we're having to get used to working behind plexiglass in a lot of industries. And there becomes a lot of issues, ergonomic issues that could surround doing this. And that would be reaching, if not considered um, before the implementation and how to manufacture it, a worker could be reaching more, they could impact the hearing. So maybe employing some type of rotation schedule. So there's, you know, you only have to work at the front counter for so long and then you would go to a different um, area within the building. So just those rotation schedules are something, our administrative control that can be uh, used. Melissa? Like I said, yes? Uh, we've just had some people uh... Sorry, Val, I think you're on mute again. Um. Sorry, I'm not sure how much of you heard. Some people are having difficulty hearing, so just making sure that the microphone is close to your mouth and maybe speaking a little bit slower. Okay, and I will... it's, it's all really great. So, but we just want to make sure everybody. <laughs> no can hear problem. It. I'll approach in a little bit closer here to the microphone, and hopefully that works. I apologize. We did do some testing, and it seemed okay, but um, I will lean in a little closer for you guys. It does help for, uh, it, it seems to be a mixed uh, that some people have a difficulty and some don't. So um, go ahead, sorry to interrupt everybody. Oh. Lots yeah. of people now are saying it's fine. So I, anyways, okay. um, I, I just wanted to I let really you know. just at, at one with my monitor here, I'm so close to it. But uh, <laughs> I just, as long as you guys can hear, that's what really matters. But it doesn't sound very ergonomic to hug your computer, but. Uh, We're only gonna do it for a short period of time, so it should be okay. Okay, thanks. So when we're looking at personal protective equipment as um, forms of controls, one of the common ones that we're seeing right now, obviously are face masks and shields. They're having to be worn at a lot of different commercial settings. A lot of um, municipalities, um, provinces have mandated these use, the use of these items. Um, gloves are one that we see a lot. And this is even prior to the pandemic. There's a lot of uh, different manufacturing facilities, different healthcare. Um, facilities that you would have to have gloves be worn when you're in them. Safety glasses are, are some uh, PPE and also gowns for healthcare workers. So what we're seeing um, as a result of COVID-19, there's a lot of different workplace changes that we're having to um, adapt to. We have staggered work hours. So you might have employers now having different start and stop times, or maybe even implementing shifts. And it's just a way 
of reducing occupancy and crowds within work so you can maintain that physical distance. We have the ability to, in some cases, work from home. And then obviously this has many benefits as well, but also poses some challenges too. We have facilities now and small businesses kind of reinventing themselves or offering new types of products. So they're producing ventilators or face shields now where on the same lines perhaps as they produce something else. So this does pose challenges to, to employees having to adapt to the changes in production and had they consulted their workstation surroundings when they um, implemented a new, a new material that they're supposed to be building. So it can add ergonomic hazards as well. We're also, our workforce has changed. We have physical deconditioning. When you think of it, a lot of people were out of work or working from home for at like three to four months or continue to work from home. So this has done stuff to our, our bodies. You know, we've kind of become inactive over that period of time as well. So what are the implications of this when returning to the workforce? There's also new safety measures that employers are having to use as a result of the pandemic. And that could require wearing additional PPE or wearing PPE. You may not have had to wear PPE before, and now you're having to wear face masks at work. It could be the installation of barriers. A lot of workplaces are having to do this, especially if they have a customer service type of an area. And we're having to transform workspaces to allow for that physical distancing as well. So our workplaces are undergoing so many different changes right now. So when we look at COVID-19 and we look at some of these controls that I talked about that help reduce a person's exposure to um, the hazards, one of the controls I mentioned, an administrative control, was job rotation. So job rotation is used to reduce exposure of an employee to that particular hazard. So they're not doing anything particular with the hazard. The hazard still exists at that, say, that workstation. What they're doing is putting a different person in it, you know, every hour, every break, in order to reduce the exposure to everyone as a whole. But well, the issue with this, especially if you're doing a break to break, is the whole cleaning and disinfecting of that station. So is job rotation even possible right now? Do you have the manpower to throw at being able to properly clean that station before the next person comes in? Well, this could be seen as a bad thing, but it also could be seen as something positive because now maybe we can actually address that hazard. We can, instead of administering um, an administrative control, maybe what we need to do is get an engineering control in there. So for example, if before it was a, um, you were lifting something that was heavy and so we wanted to limit the exposure, maybe putting some type of a lift assist in there. So that way you're reducing it even further. The same thing occurs with the two person or team lift. So these are often used in uh, scenarios where the loads are either heavy or they're unbalanced or quite large. And so an administrative control would be to throw more manpower at it. So again, you're not reducing or eliminating that as a hazard, but you're putting more manpower so that the load spread over two or more people. Again, what you could do in this situation is change it to an engineering control. So you need less manpower and you're going to be able obviously to maintain physical distance and you're actually doing something about that hazard. Now social distancing in and of itself can be very uh, challenging, especially in manufacturing facilities. We're going to go over four kind of different scenarios and it's not necessarily feasible in every environment. I know to say that to move people across the line or to extend a line, that might not actually work. But these are different scenarios that you could try. So the first diagram here is showing a kind of a bad setup. You have workers that are directly across from each other and they're closer than six feet next to one another. So what you could do is move everyone to one side of the line and space them out six feet. So like I said, um, you know, if you have this space and whatever you're producing would allow for this, this is a great option, but that's not necessarily always going to work. 
So in the first diagram here, maybe you're able to move everybody to one side of the line, but you know, the six feet, we can't do it. We don't have that much line. We're gonna have to get a little bit closer than that. So what you can do then is put some type of barrier in between you and the person across um, next to you rather. In the diagram below that, if that scenario is not possible at all, it's more of putting the barriers in each direction there to protect yourself and you know, across from and beside that person. So it just really depends how you use your line, if any extra space um, is available to extend. Um, but if it isn't, then you use barriers to be able to maintain that social distance. In an office environment, um, it's a more static environment, but it does pose challenges because we do find um, offices are getting more and more crowded. You're putting smaller and smaller workspaces in. And so a way to kind of promote social distancing within an office environment would be allowing for staggered workstations. So in this diagram, you see how there's no one across from them. There's no one beside them. And by doing this, um, you're reducing the occupancy of the building as well. So the flow of people around the office is reduced. So your chances of running into people is also reduced. You could also adjust starting times. So by adjusting starting times, you don't have those sudden influx and efflux of people entering and leaving the building. Um, also by the staggering too, break times are staggered. So you don't have all those people again um, in one spot or going down the hallway at the same time. One issue that might uh, come with this pandemic is that before there was a lot of uh, operations that ran 24 hours and for their 24 hour operations, they'd often share workstations. So now, I mean, it's the whole idea of sharing equipment. Do we wanna share equipment anymore? Um, if it's properly cleaned and, and disinfected, that might be uh, feasible, that might not be feasible. People might not feel comfortable with that. So it's just something to consider. You might need to reevaluate your workspace and have individual workstations for each person if this is possible. The other thing you see a lot of employers doing as well is allowing people to work from home. Um, this allowing them to work from home obviously eliminates all this uh, these risks and these challenging environments as far as you know people moving around an office. And now if you're having to go back to full capacity and your footprint in your office does not allow for the proper spacing, you might have to implement some sort of barrier between the employees. The one thing that we just ask that you really, really be aware of is that whatever you're implementing, whatever you're reconfiguring the office, that you keep in mind that neutral postures like Jane talked about before are critical um, into reducing the person's risk of developing some sort of MSC. Customer service windows also um, are something that we are definitely um, seeing more and more. We in our office had them at, um, installed as well. And there's just some things that you need to consider when you're in implementing these types of barriers. You really want the um, sorry the employer and the employee to avoid having to do any extended reaches, have any of that contact or pressure points as well. As an ergonomist, um, I always typically said, um, not that we don't care about the customer, but the customer is really only on that side for a couple of minutes. So to inconvenience them to have to reach or bend forward, um, really. You shouldn't be as worried about that as your employee that's going to be doing that all day long. So you want to make sure that you can avoid doing any of those types of awkward postures. If you have to, just like that customer service window at the, uh, the fast food, you could provide some type of an extendable tool. Now, you need to make sure that if you are to provide a tool like this, that the employee can have the proper grip and that the tool is also light. You don't want it to be um, end loaded because you don't want to create another hazard while trying to fix one as well. You want to also make sure that the opening, if you have to pass any documents, you have to pass a point of sales terminal to a customer, that there's enough hand clearance there to reach forward and give that to the customer. 
And finally, you want to make sure you're able to hear the person on the other side of the barrier as well. When we can't hear people, we tend to um, assume an awkward posture to get closer. When we look at the ergonomic risk um, of PPE and having to wear more PPE now, the one, um, the one personal protective equipment we see a lot of is gloves. And what we really try to stress is that gloves are not a one size fits all. Employers need to provide gloves in small, medium, large, extra large, whatever their workforce is, the demographic of it, you need to provide options. Because gloves, what they do is they reduce a person's proprioception. And when you have a, um, a glove that doesn't fit properly, that becomes even worse. So in this diagram here, you'll see A, and an A is a glove that's too loose. When a glove is too loose, what it causes is the person to grip something a lot harder. Where in B, when a glove is too tight, it even causes the internal forces to even bend your fingers are increased. And then you're going to further try to grip an object. What you want is C. You want a glove that properly fits the hand. Some of the considerations when you're selecting gloves is you want to select the, the right glove, the task that you're doing. Are you doing a precision task? You want to make sure the material and the thickness of the glove um, are appropriate to the task as well. When we're looking at face masks and face shields, um, it's definitely something that's more and more common that we're seeing. And I'm sure you've heard the concerns of people stating that it impairs their breathing and it increases heat. Well, what a face mask does is it does create this little microclimate, but it's the person's perception that they're actually getting hot or having discomfort, but their body temperature really is not increasing at all. But this, what it does is it distracts them and it can become a safety concern. It can also cause them more stress and anxiety, which is then a psychosocial hazard. But what, what wearing face masks truly does do is that we have a tendency to drink a lot less when we're wearing a face mask. We're very cognizant of not to touch our face. And so in doing so, we, we don't really take off our face mask until you have your designated break. So it's really important um, that we maintain proper hydration while still being safe in wearing these masks or shields. When we look at PPE and healthcare workers specifically, the International Labor Organization said that the heavy PPE that healthcare workers wear can lead to heat stress and dehydration. And this is because they're wearing PPE that covers their entire body. And what this does is it traps the heat and sweat and the body doesn't have a really way to cool itself down. So what they're stating is that for healthcare workers, you need to be trained on heat stress and how to monitor it and what the symptoms are. And again, we need to stay properly hydrated. You need to drink a lot of water. When we're looking at installing barriers in workplaces, because again, we talked about some of the issues with barriers, but when we're looking at installing them, how do we know if they're high enough or how high they should be or how far away is, is good? Well, it all comes back down to anthropometrics, which is looking at the different heights and sizes of females and males. So when we're looking at a seated or a standing workstation that you need to put barriers up around, you want to be looking at the 95th percentile male. And this is just because then everybody else's head is going to be below that. I mean, you can look at your workforce too, and if you have a lot of work workers that for some reason are above the 95th percentile male, maybe you want to design to the 99th percentile male. But you want to make sure those barriers, people are able to be behind and you don't want them to be looking over those barriers at you because then it's an ineffective control. Now, when we're looking at the horizontal placement of barriers, we want to look at the fifth percentile female because what we're doing here is we're looking at reach. So if you have an employee on the other side of this barrier that needs to pass documents to and from a customer, you want to make sure they're not having to do these extended reaches. So by positioning it at the reach of a fifth percentile female, you're going to accommodate everybody 
taller and uh, of taller than the fifth percentile female as well. I mentioned this before, um, but auditory is a huge issue when implementing barriers, especially if a barrier is implemented like the diagram you see here, where it's closed on all sides. When we can't hear someone, we have a tendency to lean forward and turn our neck so that our ear is towards the direction of the sound from the customer. So what we really need to do is we need to make sure that we have a way to amplify the sound so that we're a way the person or the worker can sit back in their chair and document or do their job without assuming an awkward posture. So this might be installing some type of a speaker and amplifier when you have um, a barrier such as this. When we specifically look at essential workers, and this will be interesting to see when WSIB has printed out the data from the 2020 stats of the, the pandemic, but essential workers, especially in the beginning of this, they had, and they still continue to as well, um, increased workloads and workplace, their pressures were increased, they were often working a lot longer hours, and they had increased stress and fatigue because of all of this. So what inadvertently all these risks are doing is it increases our, the ability that they might develop some type of musculoskeletal disorder. Again, we won't really know that. It's just, you know, you see all these factors and all these risks and hazards placed on them. And it's just that effect that is the potential to lead to something like this is definitely higher. Now, as ergonomists, we always want to promote movement. And when we looked at office spaces prior to the pandemic, myself, I would always give them strategies to incorporate movement into their workday, especially if you were in an office environment that allowed you to get up and down freely. We're often asked as ergonomists, you know, should I have a sit stand workstation? And my answer was always if you have the ability to get up and down from your workstation, it's not needed. It's not good to stand all day. It's not good to sit all day. What we need to do is we need to incorporate more movement. So we would uh, give them strategies, you know, drink lots of water or coffee, because then you're going to have to get up and you're going to have to go to the washroom. Have a centralized printer or photocopier, not one at your workstation, because again, that's another opportunity to get up. Instead of instant messaging your coworkers or calling them, get up and go to their office. Well, fast forward to today, and we're living in a pandemic, and actually what we want to do now is reduce any of these kind of common areas or social interaction um, directly with, with people in that sense. So. What can we do now to promote safe movement if you know these, these kind of changes or strategies we employed before might not be seen as ideal right now? Well, again, you can stagger your workday. So we, that's reducing the occupancy in the building. So maybe you have you know the group A goes Monday, Wednesday, every other Friday. Group B is in the office, Tuesday, Thursday, every other Friday. The days they're not there, they work from home. You could stagger the breaks um, and stagger the hours throughout the day as well. If possible, if the footprint in the office allows for you know, more space to be given to aisles, you could widen aisles. We now see in supermarkets all the time these directional arrows. So you kind of have this one-way traffic so that way you're not running into people and you can maintain that physical distance. It's another strategy to help movement and help to move safely in these uh, situations. Also having separate entrances and exits that aren't directly beside each other. So that way when people are leaving and entering, they're not gonna cross paths. And also this might be the time that if you're purchasing new equipment for the, the like as far as workstation goes, maybe getting some type of sit stand workstation might be beneficial now because it can add postural variation and now an environment where moving around isn't um, seen as, uh, you know, as much of a, a positive thing anymore. The other thing, too, is if you're in your own office, try to get creative. If you're on the phone and you don't have to be on the computer at the same time, maybe that's the opportunity to put it on hands free and just walk around your office. When you're taking your breaks, your lunches, 
make sure you go outside, move around. We need to get creative in allowing ourselves to have safe movement within our work day. Now, working from home, um, and I can uh, speak to this a bit because I am currently working from home, and it is it is great. But when this first happened, I think a lot of people, and myself included, I was on March break. I came came home, and I had my laptop and I had my mouse. And so that's what I used. I used that at my dining room table because I thought, well, this is just going to be a few weeks. Well, obviously, fast forward and we're six months and this is still going on. So over time, I eventually was like, oh, I can't. My laptop's too low. I, I put it on stacks of paper. I got my keyboard. Eventually, my arm was hurting. I then had to go get my chair. So what I'm getting at is that your workstation at home needs to be set up as if your work, it was your workstation at work. You need to look at the CSA standard for office ergonomics. You don't want to be working at home and compromise any working postures and potentially open yourself to develop um, a musculoskeletal disorder because the hazards were present. So you want to have the proper setup even when working from home. The other thing that we've seen is this physical deconditioning of the workforce. Our, we've just become inactive. When this first happened in March, A, it was winter, so being able to get outside wasn't always the best option, depending on where you lived. We had fitness facilities closed, recreational activities canceled, and so in general, we were all moving less. We were finding comforts in food and drinks and you know, for a certain period of time, this was probably okay. You know, I think a lot of us thinking it was only going to be two weeks a month. But when it extended beyond that, we really needed to, you know, figure a way to, to be healthy in the midst of all of this. So what this was doing to our workforce, though, is that we had reduced muscular strength, reduced cardiovascular fitness. Our physical endurance and range of motion was also reduced. We had this uh, COVID-15, I think a lot of people were um, stating, so we managed to find some weight uh, during the pandemic. Our whole body fatigue increased. And the issue is, is if we had physically demanding jobs prior to this pandemic, it's really difficult to go back to these roles when we haven't been doing anything for several months. So when you look at, you know, waitresses and servers, you know, they're on their feet all day moving around. It's if you've gone from the stagnant life to back into the workforce, this can be very challenging. Um, so how can we prepare then for this entrance of the workers back into the workforce? And we've had people re-entering the workforce now. Um, some people are still gradually ramping up, but what can employers do to help their workers get back to work? Well, you can provide training. You want to provide training on all the hazards. Review the standard operating procedures of your, of your task. You know, it's been a long time since they've been to work, so reminding them of how to do things um, is beneficial. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. And, you know, it, six months, like, that's a substantial amount of time. You want to reduce any non-value-added activity. We've heard of employers uh, creating these at-home fitness challenges, you know, and they have these prizes at the end. And it's just a great way to increase morale, um, get employees active and connected back with work before they actually return. We want to encourage employees to communicate any discomforts. And that's the same before the pandemic. We always want to know if our employees are hurting because, you know, that gives us the opportunity to look at our operations and See if something is off. Maybe when we're ramping up, employers could opt, uh, offer more breaks, have the shifts be shorter, or use that whole work hardening type of a program to build the endurance back up and limit overtime hours. As employees, there's things that we can do as well. We can get active. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. You know, change those eating and drinking habits. We need to get some healthy eating and drinking habits. Create a routine. I know for myself prior to this, I was a get up at 5 a.m. and work out person. But the first month I would work out daily, but it'd be at my leisure. Well, this didn't last long. Within a month, I had to get back to my normal routine. And what it does for you physically and mentally 
when you can get back into a normal routine is just, uh, it, it's great. So I would encourage someone, and if you had those routines before, try to get back into them now. And then find some opportunities of how to, you can de-stress throughout the day. And that can be different for each person. It could be reading, it could be going for a walk, it could be meditation or breathing exercises, but you need to find something for you that's gonna de-stress. So I just want to take it back now to the Occupational Health and Safety Act and this idea of the internal responsibility system. So at work, it's the worker, the supervisor, employer, and this overarching joint health and safety committee that has a role in keeping our workplaces safe and healthy. The IRS, what it does is it establishes this responsibility sharing system. It promotes a safe culture and best practices and ensuring compliance, not only with the Occupational Health and Safety Act, but with the internal health and safety policies as well. It really is everybody's role and everybody within an organization's job to make sure the health and safety is maintained in that workplace. This is just looking at some different points of the Occupational Health and Safety Act in the sense that, you know, we need to provide instruction and supervision. We need to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances to protect the worker. And we want to highlight that this includes musculoskeletal disorder hazards. Ergonomics is one of those hazards that needs to be educated um, to the workers, and they need to have the proper training on how to identify these hazards. And it's really important that we all communicate the hazards. It's not just the employer's job to communicate the hazards. It's all of our responsibility, again, this IRS system, to work together to have the safest and most healthy environment possible at our workplace. And just the last slide here is that we need to know the workers' rights. Our workers' rights um, in Canada is that we have the right to know the hazards are present in the workplace. So before you start any job, you, you should be educated on the hazards. When your work environment changes, there should be some retraining that happens. We have the right to participate in our health and safety. So you have those joint health and safety committees. You have the, the right to, to you know, tell anybody about hazards and to communicate those. And we have the right to refuse any work that we might think is dangerous one to ourselves question that or came to in. our coworkers. Uh, this one was during Dwayne's presentation. And with that, we want to thank you one for your time said, today. We uh, really was, appreciate are there relevant any studies feedback demonstrating and Dwayne synergistic and I are effects able to answer of extreme questions temperatures. Now. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Melissa, one comment we had here says, job rotation isn't a great solution in the best of times. It just distributes the hazard, doesn't really reduce or prevent it. Do you have um, any comments to that? No, I would completely agree with that statement, um, but we still see a lot of people doing it. We see a lot of uh, companies that that's their idea of you know, reducing exposure of the person to that hazard, which it is, but like I said, it's not doing anything about the hazard. So maybe the positive, you know, positive things that perhaps might come out of this uh, current situation is that this job rotation thing, you know, we're having more people enter the same station. Maybe we need to just control that hazard and put some type of engineering control, like I mentioned, you know, if it, the lifting is an issue, put the actual lift assist in. I sometimes feel like an administrative control is just a company's way of not wanting to spend the money to um, properly, um, you know, control that hazard. Thank you. Another question we had here is, is there an example of a work hardening program? So work hardening programs really, um, you know, prior, like I think of them as before, like when an injured worker um, comes back and that's based on their injury, but a work hardening program would really be dependent on what the facility is and what types of tasks they do. Um, I, I guess too, it might be limiting the time spent on, on certain tasks as far as if uh, how difficult and how fatiguing they are. Um, 
though I I I, I don't want to like say one thing for sure because I would really want to look at what the actual um what the actual job is that that you know is happening at that facility to be able to recommend something. Um, it was more of something that was just said there. If you have any type of that gradual hardening, just as if someone were injured, it could be hours even. You know, if you can bring them back two to three hours, or maybe you have, you know, two hours on another break and then another two hours. So it would just be getting creative. But again, sometimes this isn't like super feasible depending on what the company manufactures or makes or or does. In your opinion, which, uh, which one are more, which one is more effective protection with PPE I mean the gloves or proving the people with the equipment for washing the hands, such as hand sanitizer or sink for washing their hands. Mm -hmm. Um, well, PPE is your is your lowest level of control, um, but it's doing something. I think, and I, I I think hand washing too is you know you're protecting yourself against the hazard, but it's not doing anything to make the hazard essentially or exposure like go away. So they're both. I feel like it would most be something that you would use in tandem. To be honest. Okay, and another question we got says, what modification should be done for the office ergonomics program? I mean, I think your office ergonomics program still needs to, I, I would say it would relatively be the same as far as, you know, you maintaining the neutral postures, but it might be, um, it would depend on your office environment. When I had mentioned before about potentially, if you're looking at buying equipment, maybe wanting to do sit stand to allow more variation, um, postural variation. But again, that's gonna be dependent on what your workspace is like, how many employees you have there. Can you allow for safe movement within the office? Um, it's hard with ergonomics because it is so dependent on what that person or what that facility does. So you might need to make some adjustments in terms of being able to incorporate more movement throughout your day. But as far as like equipment, um, everything should really follow those CSA standards. Question that has come in, this will be the last one uh, and then we'll end the session. With the increase in psychosocial impacts on the workplace with external factors such as COVID related stress and internal factors such as increased signage and additional safety slash cleaning measures, what would be uh, affected, uh, sorry, effective methods for reducing the impact that this has on both office and or frontline staff? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, the psychosocial component of all of this is huge, right? And I feel like it's very individualistic. Some people seem to deal with this, um, you know, not too bad. A lot, it's a, it's a lot to intake. There's a lot of information coming at you at back, going back to work. I mean, we're having to learn how to work again, just like the kids right now are having to learn how to go back to school again. Everything has changed. It's a lot to to deal with and I don't know if being able to have you know the the proper training on this like on the on the measures before you go back so you're not just thrown in those situations um I've heard of a lot of uh different places doing some different types of training of um coping strategies and having you know just that open office dialogue about you know talking through it I think sometimes in situations like this, people feel like they're often alone or maybe the only people feeling these different pressures. And sometimes when you are able to communicate among a group and know that you're finding, you know, that there's some common threads going, um, it, it can be beneficial. Um, I, I don't know any other like specific strategies other than, than that, but it definitely is something that we, are all dealing with and have to have to learn essentially how to go back to work and we're thinking of you know the safety at work beyond just doing the actual job that we're there for too okay that's great um so that that concludes our session for this morning uh thank you everybody for joining again please be sure to complete the feedback form that i have inserted uh, in the chat 
and direct your questions to the Ergo email that I've also included. Thank you and have a great day.